Late last year, the Documentary on One team received an email from an older woman living in Dundrum, Dublin, named Grey Cattle. And it went like this. To the Documentary on One. Hello. I'm an 81-year-old and in relatively good health. I have an idea for a documentary on preparing for death and living well in the meantime. If it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a community to dispatch her. Yours, Grey Cow. And so, at the start of this year, we sent our youngest member of the team, 28-year-old Michael Lawless, out to record with Grey. Hi, Grey, how are you? Hello. You well? <laughs> I'm well, how are you? Good. And follow her over the coming months. It is not accidental that I have a bright yellow door. I want this house to stand out among these bungalows. I can tell people it's the one with the bright yellow door. You see? In great health and looking much younger than her 81 years, Grey is putting plans in place for when she dies. Not because she has to, but because she wants to. Now, I use this wall to kind of establish something about me. When you walk into Grey's home, her entire hallway is filled with photographs from her life. All 81 years half of which she's lived in Ireland. A living history of a life not yet fully lived. I have no family in Ireland. I did have a couple of cousins out in Roscommon, both of whom have died. But I want to give people who come to my home some idea of who I am. Having never married or had children, Grey lives alone in a beautifully maintained council bungalow a home she shares with her dog, Malia. Oh, my good kid. Oh, my dog. No. Yes. As Grey shows Michael the dozens of photographs in her hallway, they detail moments in her life. Now, here's another family picture. This is, was the occasion of my Uncle Ted's wedding. So there's my mother, all dressed up, my older sister, Marnie. And where are you in that photo? I, this is me. Over here to the right, uh, myself, Anne-Marie and Kathy. Michael's aware that almost all of the people in Grey's photos are already dead. And the coats that the three of us have on, there's another picture of us in these three coats. These were our Easter outfits. And my mother would have made all three of those coats and all the dresses underneath. Yeah, okay. Now, let me go to the other end and just... Born in 1938 in Providence, Rhode Island, America, Grey Cahill was born Mary Grey Cahill, one of six children. Her earliest school report card is just like her yellow front door nowadays, not afraid to stand out. (laughs) My first report card said, um, annoys others. And my father thought this was... So funny that he just had this vision of me sitting there, annoying, annoying others. As life moved on, Grey continued to stand out from the crowd. This nun said to me one time, You are the most independent freshman I have ever met. And I thought, well, that's not bad. (laughs) And it stuck with me. I marvel that she thought she was putting me down by saying I was an independent freshman. But then there's other times that I kind of pull my punches, you might say. Today, Grey has only one remaining sibling, her sister Kathy, who's come to visit from her home in Florida. Whilst Grey is going to spend the next few months planning for what happens when she will die, Being close to death isn't something new for Grey or her sister. It's what they grew up with. I can remember as a kid, we had a lot of death in the family in the 40s and 50s. And it 
it just seemed like, oh, well, this is what happens, you know. Yeah. It was something that was very familiar to me. And, um, you know, going to funerals and going to wakes and, and yeah. that type of thing was very much a part of who we were. Exactly. You know, exactly. you show up. <laughs> you show up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Two aunts died in 43, so close together that we had a double funeral, yeah. 43. So I would have been five when that happened. And then 45, Pa died. Mm -hmm. This is our grandfather. 46, my father died. 48, my grandmother died, who was only in her 60s, actually. Gray is second-generation Irish. Her grandfather came from Roscommon. And it's that ancestry that drew Gray to settle here in Dublin in 1977, at which point she claimed her Irish citizenship. The first part of Gray's journey and planning for her own death has Michael following Gray, her dog Mollio, and her friend Teresa to Gray's family grave near the town of Lanesborough Bally League on the Roscommon Longford border. Clune Tusker. Clune Tusker. No, that doesn't trip off my tongue either. No, that's a surprise. Clune Tusker. Okay, so Sean should be here. If you if you just pull it once. Oh, maybe that's him. In that, in that point, Probably. Yes. Gray wants to check out her options to see if she can be buried in her extended family grave. And today is the day when she'll find out if that's possible or not. Here we are at Cluntuscot Cemetery. So this is where some of my family have been buried through the years. Lovely, lovely, beautiful day, beautiful setting. Fields... Ah, here we go. Here, this must be Sean. Gray meets with local gravedigger turned graveyard groundskeeper who helped restore this 12th century graveyard, Sean Carthy. So good to see to meet you. Great to see you, Gray. Welcome to the Tonto School, Gray. Yes. Can we go in and see the, the uh, grave where my family are? Yeah. yeah. The grave they're looking for is the O'Neills, Gray's cousins. Oh, it's oh my up here. God! Ellen O'Neill. Trilla Martin, it's on there. Okay, so it was the old family site, I guess. You can see it at the bottom there. That yeah, there's something else is at the bottom. John oh, died yes. in 1950, but there his wife, Mary Ellen, preceded him in 46. In 46. So the grave would have been bought at that stage. At that, in 46. That, the plot, I suppose. The plot would have been taken over. There were no buying at like graves them times. They just, no. What, you didn't buy it? No, you just took it. You just, no. Just came in, yeah. Just no. Come. Yes. Oh, it was my free. God. It was free. Yeah. Son of a gun. Yeah. And, but. But you see, the, the, generally what they've done is they're buried in townlands. See, the neighbours all came together and oh, more or less stayed oh. together. Oh. They'd stay together then, do you know? Really? Yeah, our relations would all stay together. Yeah. When you die, you just had your plot taken, that was it. Yeah. Let's see, when Mary Owen died, John would have just come down and said, they, they claim to... They claim to a plot. Yeah. More than likely, there would have probably someone even distant, more distant relations... Really? ...would have been there before that, you see. This is... This weird. is open. See, this is here since the 12th century, the middle of the 20th century. Oh. <laughs> so there's no burial Sean, records as to who's... there's no burial records. No. On average, about 85 people die every day in Ireland. Some will never get the opportunity to plan ahead. Some will choose not to plan ahead. But for Grey, in the fullness of her health, she's determined to have everything in place for when she dies. So, Sean, what do you think? Can there be another burial here? There could be another burial there. There yeah, could they, be. Yeah, there could be, yeah. Well, you're thinking you weren't there? You're not yeah. going to... Uh, if oh, it yeah. could be buried there. Of course I it mean, can be buried yeah. there, yeah. yeah. If it comes to that. Do you know if there are any other existing families belonging to them? I'm the closest. You'll be the closest. Uh, let's see, Charles and my mother were first cousins. Right. So I'm first cousin once removed to Charles. No, the last time right there was 88, so the general thing is about 30 years. Yeah. So we're just making it. You're making it, yeah. yeah. I usually there's lots of left in you yet. Like, and <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Another 10. Uh, another 10, 40, yeah. 40, I know, you 40, could. There's nothing, there's nothing to stop it. I mean, it happens there, but the only thing is you will be taking up the bones to make room for you again. You know, that does happen. And then they'll, re, they'll, re, they'll be reburied. Well, see, if you, yeah, can, you can look buried. at that there now. Mm. There's four names in that headstone. Yes. That's only a two-grave plot. Oh, it's only two? Yeah. I would have... Oh, yeah, but you can go... 
You see, there's, already, there's already four in that. Yes, yes. yes. And, and there's a possibility there's more in it from before that is now recorded on that. Right. Because there's actually no, even though you've seen green grass there, every bit of that has graves. Because yeah. they're buried everywhere in any way. Yeah. Wow. And with subsidence and that, do, can you, do you, that, is that the 30 year rule that there's allowed? Well, the 30 year rule is only more or less to do with the decaying of the body. Yes. The body. the body. And how yeah. about the, the uh, coffin? That's all going oh, to be that'll gone? That'll be gone as that'll well. That'll be gone? Yeah. More yeah. or less, yeah. Well, it depends yeah. in the coffin. If it's an oak coffin, yeah. oh my God. it'll be still there. But, I mean, do you take them up? Take them up and put them down again. Yeah. And what would they do in the... Me just take them up and put them... Take them up. What they do is take them up, right? You make yeah. a grave down, take their bones up. Generally what happened, you dig another foot below and put the bones underneath that okay. and then close it back. Okay. And you go on top okay. of that so then. nobody's oh, yeah. thrown out just because you're coming no. in. Well, you'll be no. fine with them the last day then. <laughs> <laughs> with, with your foot or whatever. <laughs> you could get the wrong foot. Listen, I want more neck. Give me more neck. <laughs> no, body is gone after how many years? Well, it's it's not gone. It depends. That would depend on the, the, the substance of the soil and everything. But 30 years, mm. they'll tell you it gets fully. You're just a skeleton, basically, at that stage. And when you're saying that when you're putting a body in and you're lifting coffins up, that must be, for grave diggers, it must be very uh, emotional, is it? Or do, is it something you get in practice at? Or? It's something you just get used to. You don't pass yeah. it. You don't even see it. You don't pass it with the heat. Or... But the coffin well, if you were is the, gone. The, well, the, the coffin might necessarily, it would be oh, more really? or less, to be very yeah. little of it. Well, I'm going to be buried in Wicca, so. Well, then you'd be sad. That'll be gone. That'll be That'll gone. Be gone. Yeah. Very fishing to be able to have that option, wouldn't it? In yes. Terms of, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it goes on all the time here, because families won't, like, even though this grave is closed. Yeah. Yes. It's closed. But I could. Oh, now, what proof am I going to have to have that I am entitled to do this? Any. Really? No. Oh, Sean, you're my man. Do <laughs> 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 I'm What's sure. your title? <laughs> <laughs> he just... <laughs> <laughs> Grey is delighted she has the option of being buried in her ancestral family grave. Whilst not religious now, having made her way through high school, when Grey was 18 years old, in 1956, she became a Sister of Mercy nun, took the habit and taught maths in a US high school. Michael is curious to know how this came about. Well, I, I thought I heard the voice of God inviting me. Can I ask what that was like? I don't know. It was just a dawning. Do you remember when? You yeah, I think that? I was in my next to last um, school year in high school. We call it the junior year. Uh, I started thinking seriously. Now, the truth to tell... I probably subconsciously saw that this was a way to get an education because college education in, in the States was quite expensive at that time. My brother had gone to college, but the boys were um, able to get construction jobs during the summer. And, you know, you can't do, you couldn't do that as a girl. You couldn't get a job as, in construction that would get you your tuition. And do you regret going in? Oh, not at all. Not at all. I sometimes, more so in earlier years, I wish I had gone through the whole process a bit quicker. I tell people I spent five years becoming acclimated to being a nun, five years living that life, and five years working my way out of it. And I did all that in 13 years, not... 15 years, you know, so there was some overlap in all cases. But that was how it panned out for me. But was there a big reason why you wanted to opt out of the, You know, this was the 60s in the wake of Vatican II. And what is Vatican II? Oh, Jesus. Forget I'm talking to two generations younger than I. Pope John the Twenty Third, who was elected Pope after Pope Pius XII, who had served for... Hans. After a lesson on Vatican II, Michael learns that after leaving the convent at the age of 31, Gray counselled other nuns who'd left convent life as they transitioned to the outside world. She then worked in a variety of community work roles before turning to buying and selling antiques. I had met this man who was a cabinet maker, an old guy who was a cabinet maker. 
he taught me a bit about restoring old furniture, but also about dealing in antiques. So my hobby, you might say, was going to auctions and buying things. After a really harsh US winter in 1976, Gray wanted to try somewhere new and was drawn to Ireland by her extended family. She settled into Dublin in 1977 and never left. After a brief foray into antiques, she worked as a home help cook until she retired. Talking about and planning for her death was something that Gray first raised with her own GP. So I said to her, the next time I'm in to see you, I'd like to talk about end-of-life matters. And she was up and running with that. She wanted to talk about it on the spot because this woman had had cancer, had taken a year off to recover from cancer. She started with enduring power of attorney and the legal matters and health matters. And as I was leaving, she said, oh, I have a booklet for you. I have a booklet. And she went and got this booklet and gave it to me. The next time I rang for an appointment, I was told that she was in hospice care. She was dying. We had this conversation in the autumn, and she died in January. The booklet that Gray's GP had handed her was a Think Ahead booklet, which the Irish Hospice Foundation created to provide a guide to help people discuss and record their preferences in the event of an emergency, serious illness or death. Oh, no, isn't this cool? so, uh, Gray spends her days with her dog, Mollio, and a wide circle of friends. And some evenings, she plays cards. Tonight, Gray has yeah. invited along Rebecca Lloyd from the Irish Hospice Foundation to her home. Not to play cards, but to talk to Gray and her poker friends about the Think Ahead programme. You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> and, uh... Well, thank you, Rebecca, for coming round to help enlarge on this booklet, Think Ahead. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Now, ladies, what do you think about thinking ahead? Yeah. It's frightening, actually. Is it frightening because you don't want to think about dying, or is it frightening because you don't want to die, or...? Both. 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 I think... Thinking about dying, well, first of all, it brings back all the people we've lost, which is always, for me, a very sad experience. But also thinking about dying is, it's literally you're admitting your own mortality and you're saying, I know there's an end point. And uh, that's quite shocking. Absolutely. And I, I think what's very interesting whenever I speak to people, though, is that that's the most natural fear as, as not because we can't imagine us not being here. So that's that's a, a completely a normal, natural fear. But what the research actually shows us is that we can diminish a little bit of that fear by actually talking it out, to get rid of, almost the shake anxiety. it out. Yeah, mm. to get rid of the anxiety. Yeah. But it's amazing though, Rebecca, because um, not many people want to speak about death. And that's the thing about a conversation is that it involves other people. And this is why almost we're sitting here around this table, because, you know, touch wood, we're all hale and hearty. So it's much easier for us to have this conversation now rather than around a deathbed or rather mm. than when we're in an A&E department. Because when we're at that crisis point, it becomes, very diff it becomes a very different conversation because we're making decisions very quickly. And anybody knows making decisions very quickly are often the best decisions. As the evening goes on, the women exchange various stories from their own loss to their own mortality. But it's the story of a Tipperary farmer that everyone remembers. And there's a wonderful story when Think Ahead was being piloted. There was a, it was piloted down in, in Limerick and Tipperary. And there was a farmer in Tipperary and he got bought, he was a bachelor. He got bought into uh, Limerick uh, Hospital was very, very sick and he was nearing the end of his life. And he could hear the, the great and the good coming together and saying, this is what we're going to do, whisper, 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 we're going to put him into this local nursing home, this is what we're going to do. And he said, I have the green book. And they looked at him and said, the green book, what's he talking about, the green book? So in 
a fertilizer bag wrapped up. Oh, yeah, this was a great yeah. Irish farmer in a fertilizer bag wrapped up in bungee cards, very carefully put away. It was a, a think ahead farm. Not one page was filled in. <laughs> no, but this is what's great about it. Just on one blank page, he'd written, I want to die at home with my cows. Oh, okay. Where yeah. do you think he died? At home. At home with his cows. At home with his cows because they then had a conversation and then they then stopped the whispering about this is what we're going to do. How can we get this wonderful, kind man home to die at home? A number of years ago, Grey rescued a little black and white dog, a cavachon she named Mollio. And Mollio has become Grey's constant companion. Today, Mollio is due her summer haircut. Hello, Grey. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. I opened the, the front door. So Molly O comes out, yeah. and, and look at over here. She's trying to make her escape. She got this, she got this rock out. The program calls for Molly O to get her hair cut, shaving a haircut, two bits. Mm. She doesn't mind it terribly, but she's going to resist. So let's see what I can do here. Good oh, my good kid. Oh, my darling. Oh. Yes, my sweetheart. Yeah, you know you like it in the end, don't you? You like this bit anyway. Okay, here we go. Oh, yes. Does that feel good? Hmm? It's hot weather, Molly. You're going to love this. Gray has decided that if possible, she would like to donate her body to science. And so Michael goes along to record Grey, who is accompanied by her sister Cathy, on her first meeting with Philomena McAteer, Chief Technical Officer in Anatomy at Trinity College Dublin. Grey, how are you? Hello, Philomena. So yes. glad to meet you. And this is my sister Cathy. Hi, Hi Philomena. Good she's, to meet you. She's with, me. She's with you. me from Florida. You're very welcome to Anatomy. I'll bring you upstairs now to the relatives' room. Very good. And yeah. just follow me through to the left here. Grey has registered her body for donation to Trinity. She wants to know what exactly might happen and how it might happen if her body is accepted into Trinity. So we get the phone call and we're notified that one of our donors has died. The first thing we have to do is check are they registered? If the name pops up we say yes they're registered. Then we have to contact the doctor in charge or at the time of death the person looking after the donor and we say to that doctor, um, is the donor going to be suitable for anatomy, for mm-hmm. teaching normal anatomy? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have some questions we have to ask. Is there going to be an autopsy? If there is, we can't receive the donor. Yeah. There's a list of yeah. things there. And the doctor generally says to us, no, they're fine. Everything is suitable. This lady was 90 when she died. And she was a lovely lady and will be very useful for anatomy. So once we get that, we get the OK from the doctor in charge. We then contact the family and we contact Corrigan and Sons and make arrangements for the removal to come in here. So it sounds as if, um, you, for starts, you need Kathy's a way of contacting Kathy. Yes, I would like a contact for your sister. The longer Grey is here in the anatomy department in Trinity College, the more curious she becomes on how her body will be treated after her death. How many students? There's would about be? eight students per donor, so four oh, at this okay. side and four at that okay. side. Yeah. And so your donor would be working on Grey, and they would be looking after you, looking at your, your body and saying she had lovely lungs or whatever. They, you know, they'll, they'll be remarking on different areas that are yeah. of interest. Yeah. And then they might say, did you see the, the man down there, or Henry? He's got a great um, brachial plexus or something, you know, looking yeah. at his muscles. Yeah. Uh, somebody might have a lovely big liver or a very small liver. So they look at the anomalies between one donor and the other. And we're all different on the inside, just as we're different on the outside. But we always refer to it as the anatomical body. And we try to personalise the body by giving the first name. Mm. So there's still anonymity, like you're still known as Graham, but not your second name. And the students said that they find that a great help. Mm. Otherwise, they'd feel very removed from the body completely. When I was thinking through this whole process, one of my concerns is 
minimize the danger to the world. So I rang and said, could I be, either you or your colleague, could I be buried in a shroud? Slip me into the ground in the shroud. Yes. And and the answer was, well, uh, you know, you be cut up. (laughs) And I thought of the poor attendants who would have to handle this shroud. I think the thing is, when the body has been dissected, we return all the organs, etc., to the body. For each donor, their heart and lungs, their... Yes. Everything is ticked off in the box and they're wrapped in a white tile and put into a coffin. Yes. And then we arrange yes. the funeral step by step. It's not fully clear if Gray's body will be accepted into Trinity College when her death occurs, as it's dependent on so many factors. So whilst in Roscommon at her family grave, Gray called in with Michael to the local undertaker Pat McHugh in Strokestown to see if he could be called upon should she need his services. At um, McHugh's, McHugh's gift shop. gift shop. Thought you were bringing me to a funeral director. Yes, right next door, right next door is his funeral direction. <laughs> so let's go in and see him. Pat, Gray, Gray Cow, talk to you on the phone. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> Here's my story, Pat. I have made arrangements for my body to go to Trinity College Anatomy Department. See what you're made out of. See what I'm made out of. Good turn of phrase. Um, Now, there's a possibility they will not take it, most likely because they have enough bodies, in which case the family will be tasked with Having me... I want to get rid of you. The family might want to get rid of you like that. This is true, I know. It's going to be hard for them, isn't it? (laughs) But I'd like to be buried down here at... uh, Clune Tusker. Clune Tusker. Yes. Clune Tusker. Now, which part of this are you interested in? Whatever you want me to do. Really? Whatever you want. Yeah. If, if they so take. you'd be interested in either case? I wouldn't, I sure. I yeah. Yeah, that's what the business aspect of it is about. Yeah, you know? yep, exactly. There's the other side of it too, like to be asked to do it would be something else too, you know, to be entrusted with the job. Yeah. You, you, um, how are you about the body not being embalmed? I have no problem. We're, okay. So if the body were left in my house for a couple of days, surrounded by lavender, and then you'd come and get it and bring it back here to um, Clune Tusker. If it was to be in the house, I would recommend embalming because if it was, we say, weather like this now, yeah. you know, it would be... And if it was naturally causes, you'd have some... If there was well, any I'll tell you something. If it were weather like this, it's a good chance that Trinity would take it. Well, I'd make them wait for it too, you know. You know, it'd be in no hurry going off to them. But uh, you express your wishes, that's all you can do, and hopefully they'll be carried out. And all right. that's, if not, as the saying goes, you won't be left on top anyway. So, <laughs> you know. Have you, have you an affection with Luntusk or are you from the area? I, well, my, my grandfather came from a little uh, townland called Trilla Martin. What name was it? Uh, O'Neill. O'Neill, up on the side of the mountain, as the yes, saying goes. Yes. Charlie O'Neill. Dear heart, did you know him? That I was did my, co- my mother's first cousin, my yeah. co- first cousin once removed. Yeah. Well, very good. I knew it. I know them families. That's where, are you, where are you from? This town here. This town here? Yeah. yeah. I, the third generation at the business. Yeah. Fourth, third generation, rather. And that's your sure. pub across the road as well? Oh. So is there a chance you could have, your family could have buried him? We didn't do Charles, no, no, no. no. I, I knew Charles. I knew him. I did. Yeah. I know the road up by Low um, Cox's. Do you know the road? I've been down it, and we just. I meant to, to to give Michael directions to turn into it, and I didn't recognise it. Yeah, there's a new house on the way. On that the evening, Michael and Gray head back to Dublin after a day trip with a difference. En route home, talk turns to Gray's funeral. But do you want a church funeral? Oh God, no. Have I, have I been with you so long, Michael, and you don't know the answer to that question? Tell me what you want, um, then, from that. Oh, I, I want my... I just, at this point, I want my friends to be 
very inventive and work this out for themselves. But I'm hopefully I'll get some more clues for them before that day arrives. The following morning, Michael calls over to Gray again. In planning for death, Gray is looking forward. But Michael is just as curious to look back over her life. Did you ever have relationships after the convent or did you ever oh, yeah. did you ever yeah. fall in love? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going into that. Okay. <laughs> no. You won't? Okay. No. No. <laughs> Damn, go on, Michael. Give me a break. <laughs> but but a lot of people might wonder, did did you find love or did you ever think of having kids? Well, I'll tell you, only once do ever I ever remember thinking, oh, my God, I'd love to have kids. And that was when I was in the convent. My sister Mani came to see me with her husband, and I think she had three kids at that time. And we went out for a drive, and the kids were on their best behavior. Three beautiful kids. And I thought, Jesus, God, I'd love to have kids. Passed, it passed. Yeah, I'm, I, I, was a, I am a, a good aunt, and that's a nice relationship. When I was back cl- living closer to them, like close to Anne Marie's kids, um, they, they'd um, each get a Friday, a weekend, a weekend with me. And uh, that was nice, because after a weekend, they'd go home again, you see. But was there ever anyone that you wanted to ever settle down with or to share life with? Possibly, yeah, but that didn't work out. So, and it wasn't with someone who was who could provide the sperm for to make a baby, if that's what you mean. No, would have been with a woman. Being gay and eighty-one are part of who Gray is. Another part is how she's so open with her friends about inheritance. Um, this gold necklace is the only piece of jewelry that I had that's worth anything. This came to me, interestingly, in the following way. I've asked my friends, what would you like to inherit? Some don't even want to talk about such a thing. No, 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 well, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly. No, no, no. Don't want to go there. So anyway, I said this to a woman named Valerie who has since died. She predeceased me. I asked her what she would like to inherit. And she said, oh, I've never even thought of that. Oh, and she was quite taken aback. And she looks around the room and she says, oh, I've never thought oh, You're asking me what I want. She said, I don't suppose you've thought of what you want to inherit from me. I said, well, I have actually. She said, what? Now, this woman had a load of very nice gold jewelry. Not an awful lot, but all very tasteful. So I said, well, I have actually. What? What would you like to inherit? I said, I'd love it if you left a piece of your gold jewelry to me. Okay. Oh, boy. All right. Next time she came over, didn't she have this in the little jewelry box to give to me? The chain. The chain. Yep. She gave me what I, you know, a piece of her gold jewelry. <laughs> That gold chain that Grey inherited from a friend will make its way to a grandniece of Grey's when she dies. We're at the solicitor's office. I want to get some advice regarding the making of my will. Good morning, good morning. Grey has made an appointment to see her solicitor, Anya Hines, to make her final will. And she's invited Michael along to record with her. They're just looking at a list of my assets and how I wish some of it to be distributed. Just in terms of the legal requirements around making a will, you're not permitted to have another person present. We're not permitted to take your instructions in that manner. Okay. So that there's no consideration of undue influence. Now, I don't think you're going to be undue (laughs) influencing. The, The rule is that you have to make it alone so there's no perception right, so of, of somebody it, being um, today put under. I'm, I'm working on advice around yeah. what I've done and how I proceed. So mm. is it won't be the final will today. No, it won't be the final will today. We wouldn't make we wouldn't really be in a position to 
uh, take your instructions to then advise you in relation to the various tax implications, etc., yeah, yeah. and then draw up a will. We wouldn't be able to do that in one sitting. Okay. So that's fine. Mm. But, but even giving instructions for a will yeah. and then making the will, they are oh, okay, matters yeah, that you have that. to do yeah. alone. Yeah. Uh, without somebody else being present. But there's okay. certain certain matters that we can probably deal with that wouldn't need to be... Michael leaves Grey alone her. with her solicitor. Okay. The following day, Michael is back at Grey's home, looking at a plastic bag in her hallway. Now, Michael, in this lovely hallway that's so carefully laid out, you may wonder why there is a shopping bag sitting there. Yeah, there's a little shopping bag, little... Little. Plastic, <laughs> a, a little, little plastic bag sitting at the bottom of the hallway. What's that all about? Yes. Well, when I think about my demise, I like to say death, actually. I hate passing or passed away or something like that. When I die, it occurs to me that those that have to take care of the afters <laughs> are going to have quite a job on their hands. So... I'm trying to reduce, all the time reduce, what I have. And therefore, when I come across something, either a book that I've read and I'm not going to read again, or an item of clothing that I haven't worn in years, or something from the kitchen that's superfluous to my needs, I bring it out and put it into the bag that I have here. Now, all that's in here is a few scarves and a few books. But you can it's likely to find anything in there. But the whole point is to keep clearing out as much as can be cleared out. So while as many people on. are so while many people are doing spring cleaning, you're doing wake cleaning. Wake oh that's the point that's the point. <laughs> well put. Well put, Michael. <laughs> Grey Cahill has a plan in place for when she dies. She's thought it through carefully and knows what she wants. Anyway, all of these things have kind of crystallised some details for me about viewing life, really, viewing life, as well as preparing it, it's not a matter of preparing for death. Monica said it on the phone. This is the 96-year-old that I was talking to yesterday. She said on the phone, uh, the whole of our life is a preparation for death. And I quite agree with that. It means being aware and that that's the end of this life as we know it. And therefore, we should be careful how we live. We should be caring at how we live. And I said to you, you know, my expectation of reincarnation, re-bodiment, refleshment is that the worms <laughs> and the mood lights go to town on me and, and from thence, you know, we have earth and from the earth things grow. But what I'm thinking more of is there's other ways that we throw ourselves into the future, namely in creating memories for people, in creating things for people. Something like that goes on as well. Michael, what, what, how have you found the process? How has it been for you making this? I didn't think making this documentary would make me think about my own demise as well as yours. And I suppose we've been to so many places where we've had to. Yeah. I did. At 28, it's not something that I'm giving massive thought to. But even the simple things of maybe just telling your family what your basic wishes are, are really important. I think what you're doing with the likes of giving your body to science is really, really honourable. I don't think it's something I would be able to do. But I think making the will is really important and having that conversation that people aren't. I suppose at 28, you don't, you don't think you're going to die tomorrow, but you can. It can happen to anybody at any stage. So yeah, so I... I really enjoyed it and it's been, it's been good. Good, good. Nine months after first meeting Grey, she's in as good a shape both physically and mentally as when Michael first met her. And are you scared of death? Well, I would say no. I'm, I suppose I'm, what I'm afraid of is 
How will I respond to pain? How will I respond when it's actually happening? I have to admit, I don't know how I'll respond to that. Yeah. I can't glibly say, oh, yeah, oh, I'll be philosophical. I'll say, oh, right, here you come, death. Welcome. I can, you know. <laughs> and I'm wondering, do you have any advice to others? Get with it. Just talk about it. Recognize it as part of living. Dying is part of living, and living and how you respond to it is part of dying. Yeah, I, I, I said this to you before. I suggest it as the title for this whole program. Death. Don't leave it till the last minute. It's my advice still. Consider it. Thanks very much for letting us record you over the past few months. Uh, Yes, yes, it's it's been fun. It's been an experience. Thank you. Good luck. Take care. Are you on WhatsApp? I am? Yeah, so am I. Okay. Great. Take care. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.